Does the British 1796 light cavalry sabre represent the triumph of style over substance? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatory. Now this is a video not exactly totally just about the 1796 light cavalry sabre. So if your primary interest is in medieval renaissance ancient world swords, this video will hold something for you to think about, I believe. So first up, the 1796 light cavalry sabre used during the Napoleonic Wars was designed by John Gaspard Le Marchand, was heavily in, um, uh, influenced by prior Austro-Hungarian sabres, so it didn't spring uh, completely out of his own mind. It was based on Austro-Hungarian sabres that went before. And frankly, it enjoys a pretty legendary status. Even people who aren't really interested in industrial era swords, post Renaissance swords, maybe their main interest is in Roman swords or medieval swords, they all seem to want one of these British 1796 like cavalry sabres. And I'm an antique sword dealer, as you may be able to guess, and I have sold a lot of these. I, I have lost count how many, dozens and dozens and dozens of these, and they are not that easy to get a hold of anymore. They sell, generally speaking, very quickly, um, and the prices on them has gone up and up and up since I started collecting when I was a teenager all those years ago. Um, so, thinking about this objectively as a sword, I've read a lot of period sources, some of which I've related on this channel indeed. Check out my History Time playlist, incidentally, if you haven't done already. And the fact is that this sword was pretty well liked in its time. And you could say, well, you finished the video right there. It's not, it's not, Matt. It's not a triumph of style over substance. Um, and maybe I agree with that, but maybe not for the reasons that you think. So first of all, this has a sort of legendary status in its cutting power. Okay, now, is it a good cutter? Yes, it is. Um, and some people would say that it's better to have a sword that's really good at one thing or a weapon. It could be a firearm, it could be a, um, a type of javelin or a bow or whatever. It, it's better to have one that's really good at one job rather than one that's kind of okay at lots of different jobs. And it's always that balance between specialization and being a compromise or jack of all trades. Now, this is very specialized. It's sacrificed thrusting potential um, due to the shape of the tip to maximize cutting potential. It is curved. It therefore um, has certain uh, deficiencies in terms of reach and delivering the point. Also, it doesn't have very much hand protection. Now, funnily enough, as anybody who watches my videos will uh, regularly will know, um, you don't gain something without losing something else. So one of the major criticisms that was um, kind of pointed towards this sword, in fact, the two main criticisms that were pointed towards this sword was number one, it was no good for thrusting. Now, obviously you can stab anything with a sharp piece of metal, but compared to most other swords, this is not very good at thrusting because of the shape of the hatchet tip, the curved blade, so on and so forth. It's not very long and so on and so forth. Okay, in terms of the hand protection, yes, indeed, it doesn't have very much hand protection. My reposts to those accusations are, firstly, um, that it has maximized cutting potential. So you can cut really very effectively still with the tip of this weapon. Whereas most swords that are even remotely good for thrusting, you can't do that. You're usually having to cut f much further down, which have reduces their effective cutting reach. And in terms of the hand protection, um, the simple fact is that by keeping it light at the hilt, you keep a light overall weight of the weapon and you keep the uh, sort of um, mass distribution more in the blade, which again adds to its cutting potential. But I'm going to put that sword down for a second because just to put this into context. So as you well know, I have sung the praises of the 1788. And I just want to remind you that when the 1796 light cavalry sword was brought in, this sword by Le Marchand and other people came under certain degrees of criticism for being too big and unwieldy and having a straight blade so not being so good at cutting um, and this kind of stuff. And also, in fairness, part of the criticism was because it relates to consistency and uh, of pattern. In other words, not all of these 1788s were the same. They came with various different types of blade, uh, at least two main groups of hilt variation. Not all of them were symmetrical, some of them were asymmetrical. Um, so there's also a question about consistency and quality of manufacture in here as well, not just simply the, the overall design. But on the surface of it, as I have often pointed out in my videos, I think this has 
All of the advantages, it doesn't matter whether you're fighting on foot or horseback, all of the advantages over the 1796 like cavalry sabre because it has almost unrivaled hand protection. I mean, pretty much on a, par a parallel, on a par with Highland basket hilts or the Italian Schivona, Venetian Schivona. Um, it has a longer blade, so greater reach. It has a much better point for thrusting, which on both on foot and on horseback later on, people would come to regard as the primary thing. Um, and quite frankly, if I was to have to fight in a one-on-one -on -one fight, I can't ride very well. I've only ridden a few times in my life, but if I was going to have a one-on-one -on -one fight on foot, I would 100% rather have this sword than the 1796 like cavalry sabre. But this is a heavy cavalry sword. This was used by uh, essentially dragoons and horse guards at this time. So what were the light cavalry using? Well, just so happens I've had one of these come into my hands very recently. This is the predecessor to the 1796 light cavalry saber. I just hold them both up uh, together. And you can see that fundamentally they're in the same ballpark of swords. They are both curved, they are both sabers, they're about the same size. Although I have to say this is the 1788 light cavalry saber. And the 1788 light cavalry saber, much like the heavy there, varies a lot. So some have got much bigger blades than others. I actually have another one uh, in my collection which has a much longer blade than this. Uh, but nevertheless, they've both got stirrup hilts. In other words, minimal hand protection. I'll just put the 1796 down for a second. So what is this sword lacking that the 1796 introduced? Well, first of all, let's just mention it in passing, the quality control, um, the regulation, so they were all the same size, all the same design, they were all, you know, put through the same kinds of tests. These earlier ones were not, they varied much, much more. And one regiment of, of light cavalry um, might have a completely, well not completely, but a, a more or less differently shaped and proportioned version of this sword than another regiment. So consistency is good in modern militaries. But this is actually a more nimble blade. Uh, despite the fact they weigh about the same, the mass distribution is slightly different. And this, as you can see, doesn't have such a broad uh, fat hatchet tip as the 1796, and therefore it feels lighter at the tip of the blade. So I would say that the 1788 is a lighter, more nimble, and actually more wieldable, more easily handled sword. And I think it's no coincidence that infantry officers in the Napoleonic Wars, particularly in the Peninsular Wars onwards, uh, that started adopting sabres initially as non-regulation swords. They were supposed to carry spadroons, but infantry officers, a lot of them would rather fight with the sabre, and I can't blame them. Uh, a lot of them actually chose blades that were quite similar to this, uh, to the um, 1788, you know, much kind of lighter and slimmer tipped than the cavalry versions. Um, not only is it slimmer at the tip and therefore a bit nimbler at the tip, but it also, they're helpful, has a much more appropriate point for thrusting. It is a spear tip and quite pointy. So indeed, although this is curved, it's not hugely curved, this is now more appropriate for thrusting and a little bit more wieldable for cutting. Is it going to cut as powerfully? No. I'll come back to that point. The 1796 is definitely more specialised. This is more of a compromise. However, I don't fundamentally think there's anything wrong with this model of sword. Okay. Now, it should also be mentioned that when the 1796 came under criticism, as I said, one of the main points it came under criticism for was the nature of the point and not being able to thrust very well. So one of the solutions that they came up with was this, the Osborne and Gumby clipped point, or kind of clipped, kind of drop point, somewhere between the two, a um, bit like a giant bowie knife or a falchion or a mesa. Um, and this compromise means, yes, indeed, you can't cut so well up near the tip as this typical 1796, but you've got a much better point for thrusting. And also notice it's slightly less curved as well, which again makes it more appropriate for thrusting. Most of these didn't have any additional hand protection, so we've still got the hand protection issues. So, was the 1796 all that good then? It didn't have great hand protection. Later models introduced more hand protection in 1821 onwards. And indeed, previous swords, like we've seen with the 1788 Heavy, had more hand protection. And indeed, certain officers towards the latter part of the Napoleonic Wars, around the Battle of Waterloo period and the run-up to that, started adopting three-bar hilts, which later became regulation. So they wanted more hand protection as well. So, more hand protection, generally speaking, a good thing, even if it comes at the cost of a bit of extra weight and therefore changing the weight distribution of the sword, perhaps making it 
slightly less uh, effective or efficient, should we say, at cutting, as um, Colonel Mary Mong details in his treatise A Memoir on Swords, incidentally. But do I therefore think that the 1796 light cavalry sabre is simply a matter of this looks freaking awesome and that's why everyone loves it? No. And here's why. It is utterly specialised towards the cut, and we've got numerous sources from the Napoleonic Wars saying that no matter how much cavalry troopers, and bear in mind a lot of cavalry troopers were literally taken straight off farms uh, at the age of 17, 16, 17, 18, and put straight into the army, they were trained for a minimum amount of time, they were trained to use a sword, initially on foot, then they were trained to ride, because many of them had never sat on a horse before. They'd grown up on farms, but they were poor and had never sat on a horse or ridden a horse or owned a horse. So they were taught to ride the rudimentaries, they were taught to use a sabre, the rudimentaries, and they were given one of these. Now, in that context, these are not, for the most part, skilled swordsmen. They might have been after several years of service and training, but initially they were not skilled swordsmen. And what uh, various people, various Austro-Hungarian commentators looking at British cavalry and um, uh, John Gaspard Le Marchand argued, was that uh, basically you wanted something that was going to be easy to use at its specific job, okay, um, for your common cavalry troopers. And the fact is that he argued that the 1788s were often too long, too heavy, too uh, unwieldy for these. And you've got to remember their size as well. So we're talking about, you know, late 18th century, end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. The average size of um, you know, rural working class folk was small. And we know that from the uniforms and headdress and other accoutrements. They were small. I'm six foot one and about, I don't know, 190 um, uh, pounds, but they, they were a lot smaller than me. Um, now, if I find this unwieldy on foot, then most of them would have done as well, although fair enough, they would have grown up pushing a plow with a um, with a, uh, an ox or a horse pulling it, so they may have been stronger than me, I don't know, but um, I do use swords for a living and throughout my life for the last 20 odd years, um, and the fact is that these aren't, although they're quite light and manoeuvrable and I can move it fairly quickly, they're not great fencing swords, they don't move in that way. But what they are good at is if you're riding on a horse, and your instinct is just to whack someone in front of you, this works great. And this is why, despite the fact that it does look awesome and everyone wants one because it is stylish looking, and don't underestimate how important that was to soldiers at the time and soldiers today. Soldiers today care what their rifles look like. Nobody likes to have weaponry or uniforms that look dumb. They want to look cool. They want to look tough. So... Yes, absolutely, it was important that people in period thought these looked awesome, and we know they thought that, first of all, because they wrote it, but secondly, because they all copied it. Everyone from infantry officers to naval officers to generals suddenly started modelling their swords on the 1796 light cover shape. So everyone thought this looked awesome, and it still looks awesome, and people still want to buy them because they look awesome. Don't think that this is the best all-round sword, however. This is a type of blade which is absolutely specialised and optimised towards people giving great big old slashes and chops, okay? And it was super popular for that reason and probably very effective for that reason and sharpened up ones these days using on tatami mats or water bottles or anything else, they cut very, very well and very instinctively and very easily. They don't twist in the hand very easily. You pretty much always hit with the edge thanks to the curvature of the blade. And you, despite the fact they're only a 33 inch blade, you can hit someone from pretty much 33 inches away because even the shape of that hatchet tip cuts well when pointier swords, even the Osborne and Gumby, can't do that. Okay, so I do not think that this was a triumph of uh, style over substance. I think that these were highly effective but, ironically, the thing that they come, came under criticism for, not being good at thrusting, not having a lot of hand protection, those are all things which contribute to them being so bloody good at the one thing they were designed to do, and that was chop and slash, which they reigned supreme at, and they did very well at. Thank you. I hope this has been thought-provoking and interesting, and of course you can apply everything I've said here to other weapons you might look at through history, whether it's a gladius 
or a uh, basket hilted broadsword or a rapier or a dao or a katana or whatever. Um, thanks a lot for watching. Give us a thumbs up, please, and make sure that you are subscribed if you're not already. Thanks for watching, and I hope I'll see you back on the channel soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.